Welcome everyone to the final edition of the Berlin Functional Programming Group's summer series of online meetups. We're not finished forever, just for the summer. I'm going on vacation, but I will be back in September to do more of these. But I think that we are finishing off the series with a real bang tonight. I am I'm thrilled and honored, I should say, to, to introduce Edwin Brady. Uh, I can't believe he said yes. He's obviously a, a very generous soul for doing this. I know he's very busy and I know you all know who he is. So he does not really need that much of an introduction. He is the creator of the Idris programming language and also Idris 2, which he's going to tell us about tonight. And at the moment he is a lecturer in computer science at the University of St. Andrews, where I think they invented golf. Pretty much, not at the university. <laughs> Somewhere nearby. <laughs> Over the road uh, in my office, in fact. Right, right. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk because it's just such a such a pleasure to have someone uh, of your of your stature and influence visit our our tiny little Berlin group. And I think everyone is very excited to have you. And I hope everyone has lots of interesting questions to ask. So I'm going to ask the audience if you have a question, type it into chat, and I will find an opportune moment to interrupt Edwin to uh, let you ask your question. And, and he has promised to try and create a few opportune moments. And I think everything will go swimmingly. So without uh, anything further, I am going to hand it over to you, Edwin, and allow you to share your screen and take it away. It's all yours. Okay, so if I, um, uh, where are we? If I do that, is that good? Do we have the whole screen? Yep, looks good. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I, uh, I'm very happy to be in virtual Berlin. I, I, I'd much prefer to be in real Berlin. Um, it's one of my one of my favourite cities. But uh, alas, soon I hope. Hopefully, I'll uh, I'll be able to come and visit you in person at, at some point in the not too distant future. So. Um, Oh, actually, an important question. I should have asked this earlier. Is how long have I got? I'm, I'm pitching it by about an hour. Is that uh, you have? You have absolutely as long as you need. Oh, uh, so, I've done these. I've done these for two hours and three hours. So don't feel obligated to go uh, for a very long time. But you have as much as required. So well, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So um, as uh, as as Stephen said, what I uh, what I want to do is um, introduce Idris to. So this is. Uh, uh, to show you the, the new things that I've been doing in Idris 2, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna assume that that the audience is even really aware of what the old things are in Idris 1. Um, so rather what I'm gonna do is tell you what Idris is and illustrate it with several hundred examples. So we'll <laughs> we'll we'll go until until I get hungry, I suppose. Um, so um, <clears throat> Idris is a functional programming language, which is a good start for a functional programming group. And I, I think that the thing I like to say about it that makes it, or it sets it apart from other languages you might know is this idea of uh, first class types. So when we, when we talk about functional programming, particularly pure functional programming, I'm kind of guessing that there's going to be a significant number of uh, Haskell programmers in the audience, for example. So we talk about first class functions as in ability to assign functions to variables, return functions from functions, pass functions to functions, and so on. So functions are just like anything else. So in Idris, the thing, is, uh, the thing additionally on top of that is that uh, we have first class types. That is, uh, functions can return types, you can pass types to functions, you can even, in Idris 2, um, in inspect types at runtime, which leads to all sorts of um, uh, interesting possibilities. So, um, so I'll illustrate all of those things and I'll, I'll give you an idea of, um, of what it means to program in Idris, what it means to do um, what I like to call type-driven development. Um, so I'll talk about what type-driven development is. I'll talk about um, doing interactive programming. So I think that where things get really interesting if you have um, expressive types is programming becomes more of a conversation with the machine. And this is, or if there is one overall um, point to why I, why I like working on Idris and why I'm having so much fun with this, is that it's turning programming more from, you know, you, you, you don't write your, um, 
uh, you know, hieroglyphics and send them to the Oracle and then get a, get a message back saying <laughs> it went wrong, you know, see me after class. Uh, rather, you, you, you write part of the program, you leave some holes in the program to fill in, and you let the machine help you find your way towards the working program. So it's kind of deliberately by analogy with test-driven development. So in test-driven development, the idea is you write the test first because you want to think about, you want, well, you want that to help you design what the program is going to do, how it's going to work. And the tests are there to help you think about what, it, what the problem even is you're trying to solve. Similarly with type-driven development, the types are there to help you think about um, what the problem is you're trying to solve and have the machine help you get there. And I suppose now's as good a point as any to say, I, I want to be totally explicit about this up front. There is absolutely no conflict between type-driven development and test-driven development. Um, I do test-driven development as well. Uh, sometimes sometimes I, I, I write the program, uh, I write the test and then try to work towards getting that test working. So there, there, there's no conflict there. Don't let anyone ever tell you that there is. Um, types and tests work really nicely together. So type-driven development, having, having expressive types for your program, helps you maybe write fewer tests, but you still have to write tests. So the new thing in Idris 2, and you may not know this if you haven't seen Idris 1, but the, 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 the most interesting new thing in Idris 2 for me is the idea of quantitative types. So quantitative types, the idea here is that every variable, every binder has um, a quantity associated with it. Um, and if, in my world, there are three interesting numbers, zero, one, and I don't care. So zero is a variable that is not going to be used at runtime. So something we can talk about at, at compile time, but it's not going to be there at runtime. One is for variables that have to be used exactly once at runtime. Um, so this leads to all sorts of interesting things, and that's, that's most of what I'm going to show you. Uh, and then don't care, that's basically back where you are in um, the regular everyday uh, programming language. So I'll show you some examples of that. I'll show you how uh, zero gives you guaranteed erasure. I'll show you how one gives you linearity. And I'll show you how that helps you write uh, nicer APIs for some of the things that you just do every day when you're programming. Right, that's enough slides for now. Um, I'm going to move on to, I mean, this is, this is what I like to do. I just like to write programs at you. So I'm, I'm going to write programs at you for the next you know, <laughs> five hours. Um, right. Um, so is this, uh, is this visible? Is, is this good? Is my font size okay? Yep, yep. I good. can see it. Um, I mean, <laughs> you should be seeing exactly what I'm seeing, but um, the problem we have here is that we're using computers, so who knows? Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely big enough. Very good. Um, I want to start with something. So I sort of, I'm assuming that the audience knows a bit about functional programming, but I'm not going to assume you know anything about. We're talking about first class types. So I'm going to start with something that that you've almost certainly seen before in some form, and that is I've got a little function here that that takes a, a pair of integers, which is imagine a point in a coordinate space and another pair of integers, which is the amount we're going to move it by, and all it does is, is move that point along. So if you're writing something like this, let's say you're doing it in Haskell, um, what you'd probably do is say, well, that, that pair of ints, that's actually, that's a point. We'd like to like, encapsulate that somehow. We'd, we'd like to at least not have to write int, comma, int every time. So what you do in Haskell is you'd write a type synonym. So when you write a type synonym, that's, you, you are, you're really doing type level programming. But in my world, um, so what I like to call type level programming is, uh, is programming. So, so in my world, I would, rather than write a type synonym, I would write a type level function. I'm going to call it point, which returns a type, and point just takes uh, a pair of in. So we've, we've already seen first class types in action here in that to write that, um, uh, to write that function, I've said, I'm going to compute a type, I'm going to call it point, and every, everywhere I had income int, I'm going, to, I'm going to call that point. So that's just a type synonym. We do type synonyms by type level programming by writing a function that returns a type. Um, so far, so good. Hopefully not very controversial. So another thing I should say, I, you might notice what I did there. This is, uh, I'm doing this in, um, in Vim. So just because um, I want to alienate half the audience who use Emacs. Sorry about that. 
um, but also because it's my favorite editor at the minute. Um, but Vim has a, a way of talking to an Idris process. Uh, well, there is, a, there is a mode that allows us to talk to an Idris process. You can do the same thing in Emacs, you can do it in, uh, in Atom. I believe there's Visual Studio mode uh, in development. Um, so the point about um, interactive editing is you want to be close to the compiler uh, uh, the whole time. So you want to be able to ask the question, ask questions of the compiler the whole time. Compilers know a lot of type checkers, know a lot of stuff about your program. And we don't want them to keep the, that knowledge to themselves. In particular, I want to be able to regularly check that what I've got is, is working. So if I hit uh, um, a comma R here, it will, it will reload the program to check that it's okay. Okay, so this is a basic idea of, of functions can return types. We'll see a bit more of that as we go. I just want you to see that that's possible. So another thing that we're going to do quite a bit of is uh, interactive programming. So um, I've got a, the type of uh, a function here that's going to repeat some element uh, a number of times. So, so nat is uh, the type of um, natural numbers, so unary natural numbers. Uh, zero or successor. Um, and this tie, the, the fact that this begins with a lowercase t, so the, the, the rule for types in Idris is, is that uh, if you have a name that begins with a lowercase letter in your type, that is a type variable and it will abstract over it. So this is, this is kind of for syntactic familiarity with, uh, with Haskell. So I, I was a Haskell programmer before, uh, before Idris and so Kind of like some bits of the Haskell syntax, so it, it's a little bit mostly familiar to Haskell programmers. Right, so we've got a type, we start with a type. You'll notice that it type checks even though I haven't given a definition. So we have a, we have a hole uh, for this program that's going to repeat a number of elements. And the way we, we can implement it is we can say to the machine, give me a candidate definition or skeleton definition for that function. Um, and we go, it'll, it'll talk to Idris in the background and um, it'll give us that uh, candidate definition. Um, and this thing here, this rep RHS, this query rep RHS, this is a whole, but our job is now to fill in. So if I, if I ask the machine the type of that hole, so I can hit um, backslash T. In fact, does this, does this work? If I, yeah, show type in the menu there and it will show me the type of that hole and it will say you've got tie that's the type we've got x of type tie we've got k is a nat and we've also got this mysterious zero uh next to tie and what that zero means is that we are allowed to talk about that type so that is that is a thing that's in scope tie is a variable that's in scope but we're not allowed to use it in any position that's going to be used at runtime. So this is the first instance where we've seen uh, a quantity. Um, okay, so in order to um, in order to write that program, we're going to say, well, what happens if um, what happens if there's zero of these and what happens if there's a successor? So the, you see a bit of syntactic sugar here, it's turned the Z into an actual zero. Um, so if there's zero of these, we'll return the empty list. I'll, I'll just fill this out. Um, x and we'll check that, that type checks and of course it doesn't because I meant x. Um, I just do that to show you that this isn't a video and things are actually happening. Um, so again hopefully something that uh, if you've done a bit of functional programming before you'll have seen this kind of thing but the point is we're doing it interactively we're only doing it step by step step by step and checking that things are okay as we go. So I could leave this hole here and it can still type check and I could check the type. And I just have a question about the two different um, syntaxes for the lists. Oh, just because it's, it's a little bit different from Haskell. You have a, a type level version and is it like a value level version or how does that, does that work? It's always the same. So, um, oh, right, I see, I see what you mean. So, um, so in Haskell, this would be written as um, something like that. So, so list of type. And uh, I really dislike that, by the way. I, 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 I teach Haskell to our undergraduates and a significant amount of time is explaining to them that, that you know, these, these two syntaxes are, are not identical. One of them is a type level list. One of them is, a, is, a, is, one of them is the type of lists. One of them is the value of lists. And these are different things. So, so the type of list is called list and the value 
is you know we can write square brackets at syntax for it or we can write um uh the, the, the um we can write it in the form of a x cons f uh a plus. so yeah I, I personally i think that was a mistake uh, in in haskell I, I don't know i don't know whether people agree on this i don't really care whether people agree or disagree um but I, i've decided not to do that in, in idris yeah, that's what it looked like. I just wanted to clarify. Also, the usage of colons is blowing my mind. Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, um, I heard that the reason Haskell uses double colon for so in, in Haskell, this would, as long as you define the, the, the type synonym for list, you'd, you'd write it like this with the colons the other way around. I, I'm told that the reason Haskell does it with a double colon for types and a single colon for list, it, it's come from Miranda. So one of the precursors to Haskell and the creator of Miranda, David Turner, who incidentally was, uh, was a, a professor at St. Andrews um, uh, some years ago. Uh, he thought that he would be writing more lists than types. So he wanted the shorter syntax for lists and Haskell inherited that. So Idris uses uh, a single colon for types and a double colon for lists for exactly the same reason. That is, we're going to write more types than lists. Well, I think the single colon is the uh, original gangster of uh, type definitions anyway, isn't yeah, it? Exactly. Haskell so you, is the exception here. Just, you, you've brought us back to yeah, basics. That's, that's the way it should be. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's how you interact with Idris anyway. Um, so, um, you'll see here I have several hundred buffers to get through. Well, I'm not going to get through all of these, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. Now, here's a... Um, more interesting use of quantities. So, because we're going to be using quantities quite a bit here. So, this, this function, um, dup, duplicate. So, we're going to take this x, and all we're going to do is duplicate that x. So, you know, I could write it, uh, oops, I could write it by saying, I'll duplicate the x. Great. Um, but what happens if I, I could say that? I don't actually want to duplicate that X. I could say that I want to use X exactly once. So just spoiler, this isn't going to work, but let's try. Let, let, let's see what happens. So if I check the type of this, uh, this hole, super RHS, it says, right, we've got tie, we're not allowed to use that at all. And we've got X and we have to use X exactly once. So I could write a partial program, so I could return a pair of x and something. And well, now I've spent my x, I can still talk about it, but there's none of them left to use. So I could blunder on and try using it, see what happens. And the machine says, uh, nope, there's two uses of linear name x, and, uh, and that's an error. Um, just because people sometimes ask, sometimes people ask what happens if you put the hole before X? And I think imagining that type checking works left to right, think that, you know, is, is, is X usable here? Well, um, so we've, we've still spent X, but we've spent it a bit later on. So we have to use X exactly once. We're not allowed to use it more than that. And we're not allowed to use it less than that. So the, um, the intuition for how quantities work, I should maybe have written this, uh, already but if, if you have something if you have a type of this form so if we have some function type of, of 1x of type a goes to b then that means if you have f of some expression e that means if f of e is used exactly once then e is used exactly once so it doesn't mean that we're only allowed to pass things with only one use to that function. So it might be that we have some E that is some arbitrary expression that's duplicated and used all over the place. That's totally fine. The only guarantee that uh, that, that gives us, so if we have something, if we have an argument with, with a linear, uh, a function with a linear argument, the guarantee that gives us is this function will use it exactly once, meaning that if the function is called with 
if, if the function itself is used exactly once, then its argument is used exactly once. So when you talk of, when people talk of linear types, there's all sorts of things they could mean by that. And you have to look at the exact details of the, the system you're working with uh, in order to, to know which one. So the guarantee linearity gives us is, uh, the, the one gives us here is, the thing will not be duplicated in the future. It doesn't give us any guarantee that the thing hasn't been shared in the past. So we might have something, some, some shared type passed in and you know, it won't be shared anymore, but it will be used exactly once. We have a question about that. Yeah. So Torsten wants to know, what does use X exactly K times mean? What constitutes a use and what doesn't? By contrast, what does we can still talk about X mean? That's, that's a great question. And um, I'm trying, I'm just pausing because I'm trying to decide whether to answer it now or to, uh, <laughs> to, to wait till it comes up later. Let's, let's give a quick answer now. So if you do a case split on something, um, so if, if, you, if you deconstruct something, that counts as consuming it, that counts as use of it. If you pass it to a function that uses it, so that is, if you pass a variable to an argument where that argument has quantity one or don't care, that counts as a use. If you pass it to an argument that has quantity zero, that doesn't count as a use. So um, we sometimes call them multiplicities because it's, it's, it's kind of like a, you're multiplying the usage. So if you, if you have, in fact, this is how it's implemented. So if you have an argument with, uh, an argument with unrestricted multiplicity and you pass a value with one use, well, what one times unrestricted, one times unrestricted equals unrestricted, that means we're not allowed to do that. So we're not allowed to pass a, something of one use to an unrestricted argument. I think it becomes clearer though, uh, just by working through a lot of examples. So, so this will come up in a, in a couple more cases. And um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll see that. Now, um, uh, and, uh, yeah, hopefully that'll explain it and maybe I'll, I'll check later on whether it has. Um, you do also see some other functions on this screen that I've, I've left as a bit of a teaser. I'm, I'm actually going to skip them for the moment. If anyone's interested in what's going on, we can come back to it a bit later on. I just don't want to, I don't want to miss the really good stuff for the sake of laboring the, 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 the kind of core theory stuff. So um, one thing that I'm particularly enjoying with uh, Idris 2, and Idris 1 had this to some extent, but it's, the idea of interactive editing and giving precise types to things means that the machine should be able to help you with finding implementations of things. So as an example, we've got this function uncurry. That's, so uncurry is a function that takes a curry function and turns it into a function that takes a pair of arguments. So um, got a function from A to B to C, we'll turn it into a function from a pair of A and B to C. And we can write that by hand. We can look at the, check the type of uncurry RHS and we see that somehow we have to deconstruct X and pass it to F. So we're gonna to have to take the first element of X and the second element and we'll pass them to F. So one thing we can do in Idris is say, I don't wanna to have to think about how to do that. Let's let the machine do it. So uh, we've got a, a command in Vim here. Um, backslash O for obvious and it will it will essentially it'll, it'll just search it'll it'll search through the environment um, it knows about pairs so it knows whether to deconstruct things and it finds us the implementation um, but it's kind of more fun to do that just right from the beginning so I have one button press that leads you to the whole thing so um, fans of fans of par parametricity will, will realize that there is there's only there's only really one implementation of this function I guess there's a couple because you could you could pan match on uh, A B, but but there's only going to be one thing that this function does. So we can ask the machine to generate a definition from the type, and essentially it's doing the two steps that I just did. So skeleton definition search. Uh, if it doesn't find something, it will it will carry on. Um, what's kind of I just hacked this up yesterday, and I'm having enormous fun with it. Um, if you're not satisfied with the first thing it gives you, you can ask it to keep looking. So there I said there's another possible implementation of this. We could pattern match on, on X and then feed the, the results, or feed the, the, the components to F. So, so I can say to the machine, keep going, 
and we'll keep going until you either run out of definitions or we find a definition that I'm satisfied with. If I ask it again, it's run out. So no search results and no more results. Okay, so we'll generate these things. So curry works as well. Um, select things. This is just a kind of function that pulls things out of the uh, pair. It's kind of a contrived thing, but see that it's able to lock inside pairs. It's able to, to compose locking inside pairs. And then um, append. This, this is entertaining. What, uh, what do we reckon this is going to do? Um, if I search for an implementation of append on lists, um, well, that's probably not what we wanted. Uh, it's definitely type correct, but it's probably not the implementation we were thinking of. And again, we can just say to the machine, I'm not satisfied. Let's try another one. Nope. No. 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 Well, almost. That'll do. So we got there in the end. Um, so there's something about this definitely like we, that, that's that's a bit more what you know, I sort of imagine I'm hitting it with a hammer until I until it eventually satisfies me. Um, but there's there's something about this definition that uh, we kind of maybe knew in advance that we didn't explain to the machine, which is that we know when we're appending two lists, we want everything from the first list and everything from the second list to appear in the result. So we can we can cut down that search space by saying you have to use that list, the first list exactly once, you have to use the second list exactly once, then generate the definition, and there you go, you get the one that you'd that you'd hope to get. But entertainingly, you can keep looking, see what it uh, see what it comes up with if uh, if you keep looking. But uh, um, yeah, it's it's getting a bit silly now. Um, but it, um, the, the, the point here is that by giving that additional bit of information, we've hugely cut down the search space of possible programs. And, uh, and we've made the, we've, we've, by giving a little bit more information to the machine, the machine is able to help us uh, a lot more. There is, by the way, I, th th this is this whole field of um, type driven program synthesis. It's, it's a fascinating one. It's a massive field. And, and I'm not really doing it justice here with, with what's implemented in Idris. So um, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a magic trick. It's, it's just sort of conjuring. It's, it's, um, if, if you know the secret, you just think, ah, oh, anybody can do that. So all you do is look for the, the type you're looking for. If it's a function type, add an argument. Um, if it's a list, well, we've got nil and cons, so we'll try nil and cons. Um, we also know we're defining append, so we'll try append. So we'll build the program bit by bit. If we ever hit anything, if we ever hit any kind of incremental step where it doesn't type check, we just rule out that entire corner of the tree and we just keep going. That's literally what Idris does. It just keeps going and um, uh, until it finds something complete that type checks. Okay, uh, any questions on that? I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Okay. But if um, someone is very quick, up, oh, well, we do have a question. Uh, Frederick uh, wants me to read the question. No, Mike. Okay. Does lowercase type? Do lowercase type variables automatically quantify over type? Uh, no, it's uh, it's over whatever. Um, it quantifies over whatever would make sense in that context. So they've all been typed so far. I haven't really shown you any dependent types so far. Um, but we're about to see we're about to see a case where it quantifies over something a lot more interesting. Um, there's a question about other operations on lists. Mm -hmm. um, Andreas, do you want to unmute? I'm not sure what you're getting at. Hello, Andreas. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yes, uh, the question is. Um, if we have a list, why it should look for a pen? So it doesn't know about a pen. You could take from two lists, you could do a lot of things. You could split them, select several elements from these those two lists. So I think appending two lists is just one possibility from several thousand. Right. The only reason it even locks is that it's because it's defining a pen. So, so it locks for recursion. That's, that is all. 
So um, that's part of the reason why this is really a, it's it as as it stands it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a magic trick, um, and there is scope for giving it more hints. So so you can you can give it hints. You can say when you do your search, search for this particular function. So it only knows about things if you tell it about things, and if it happens to be the function that it's currently defining. Um, and if it is defining a recursive function, then it will try. I discovered a bug in this earlier, but it will try to make sure that the function it's uh, generating is at least a recursive call on a different argument. So it's not going to just define f of x equals f of x. But yeah, I mean, that's, we have that's, we have one other question um, from Alex. What are those underscores up to? Oh, it, it just means I don't care about the name. I could, uh, um, what some, somehow what we'd like to do is be able to write something like this. Um, and the only reason we can't do, oh, I don't know, I guess we could, uh, linear logic fan might, uh, might like something like this. Um, so the only reason we don't do this syntax, for example, with one list is that, that that's actually one list A is actually a completely valid uh, expression that parses and because um, types are first class and functions, or, uh, literals are turned into values using a from integer function. So you can overload literals. And it's not out of the question that you might actually mean to do something like this because you might, you might define one to be a, a church numeral, which is you're applying a function once. So this just doesn't work syntactically, so um, much as we'd like to. So, um, so the underscores are, are just a, uh, a shorthand for um, the syntax requires me to give it a name, but I don't want to give it a name. Not that's all. Um, so there is one question that that, that um, I'll sort of preempt, which is that you know I, uh, as I said this is a magic trick. I'm, I'm kind of I'm cheating by by using things that I happen to know work. So when does this when does this sort of thing become useful in practice? And um, without worrying too much about what this, all this stuff means, um, this, this, this might be one way of defining a heterogeneous list in a type safe way. So defining a list where every element of the list has a potentially different type. So we have a list that says what the types of the element of the list are. Um, if we define um, a function that explains what type an element of the list is, we've kind of already defined a lookup function by explaining what the type of each element is. So um, I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to write it again. So, so that, that basically where this is useful in practice it is, uh, most often for me anyway, is that if I've gone to the trouble of defining an expressive type that explains the relationship between two things, I shouldn't also have to write the program to find that relationship. So just as a, as a small example of it in practice. Okay, so that's uh, quantities, that's search, that's how quantities help search. We haven't actually seen any dependent types yet, but, and, and I've got a, a little example of, of dependent types that I, I quite like as, a, as an introductory one, because uh, hopefully everyone understands uh, the problem, and, and it's, it's a little bit more realistic than some of the ones we sometimes use. So, um, so you may have seen uh, run length compression, so run length encoding of, of some data. So this is if you have some data where there's there's lots of values in a run, so if you've got like 10 x's in a row, then then that would just be 10 x rather than x x x x x and so on. So one thing that dependent types I find really useful for is if you have two pieces of data that are maybe represented in a different way, but they mean the same thing. And you want to say to the machine, these two things are the same. I'm probably going to get it wrong. Keep me right. So tell me when I've, I've messed up the, the distinction between these two things. So a run length encoded um, a bit of data. So what, we're, we're defining a, uh, the type of run length encoded data. And it is parameterized by a list of some element type. So We've declared here a dependent type, so this this RLE depends on some list, so it's 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 um it's uh, predicated on some list. So RLE of X's is the run length encoding of the specific list X's. So empty, you you can kind of read these in a sort of prolog programming style. These kind of predicates on a list. So um, empty says that um, empty brackets is the run length encoding of an empty list. 
And the second argument, run, takes some number and some value. And if I have some run length encoded rest of the list, and then I have n repeated x's, then that is a potential run length encoding of n repeated x's plus more stuff. Uh, by the way, this is, um, I'm claiming that this is a sound representation of run length encoded data. I'm not claiming it's complete, by which I mean it would be per perfectly possible to write 1x, 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 and so on. So um, when we write down types for data structures, oh, this, this is I think, an important point about um, programming in Idris and programming with dependent types in general. It is really tempting sometimes to write down the most expressive type you can possibly think of that captures every possible constraint on the data you're working with. So in this case, I might have to do something to, I might have to add a predicate that says X is not the first thing in this list here. And that would give me a, a, a complete definition of run length encoding rather than merely a, a sound one. Turns out, usually in practice, that, that adding more stuff is not guaranteed to be a worthwhile thing to do. So my rule of thumb is, is to start with the least possible and only add a bit of information if I've either run into an error and I think uh, a bit more in the type would help, or if I run into a situation where I have a case that I can't deal with because uh, the types aren't expressive enough. So it's generally a good idea to err on the side of, from my experience anyway, generally a good idea to err on the side of not having much in the type and refine the type as, as your understanding of the problem develops. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a function that um, converts a list into its run length encoded form, and then we're going to go back again. Um, so we're going to have to, so we've seen rep actually, we, we, we saw rep at, um, at the beginning. Um, it's just kind of entertaining to see what the uh, program search comes up with for this. Um, rather unsurprisingly, it says, well, that, that's the empty list, that's all right. Um, I, I tried this out yesterday. I thought that there's no way this is going to work. And, you know, it, it comes up with increasingly long lists of just X until it gets bored. So, okay, uh, you weren't happy with four of them. You're probably not going to be happy if I add more and more. And um, kind of amusingly quickly, it comes to the definition that we, that we actually want. So that's uh, repeating um, N copies of, of some value. And, um, I think rather than writing the run length encoding first, I'm going to write the, uh, the decompression first, just because it illustrates something really important about quantities and putting quantities in types. So we've got, um, we've got some run, run length encoded data. So the run length encoding of X's, and we're going to return a singleton of X's. So singleton here, so this is like a value singleton of some, um, some value. So, so a singleton of X, is a type that can only ever take the value x. So this uncompressed list, it can only ever take the value of x's. And it's really tempting, you can do this, this works perfectly fine in Idris 1. It would be really tempting to say, what I'm gonna do is I've already got the list. I'm gonna bring it into scope. And so what am I looking for? I'm looking for singleton of x's. Well, that's obviously just singleton of x's, isn't it? So this would, this would type check in this one. Um, but it says, nope, I'm not going to let you do that because X's isn't accessible. Why is it not accessible? Well, if we look at the, um, if we look at the type of uncompressed RHS, we'll see that, well, I'm allowed to talk about X's. And the fact that I'm allowed to talk about X's is crucial because I need to prove that the, that the value we're returning uh, is equal to X's. But I'm not allowed to actually have X's. We can bring X's into scope in a valid way. So I, I can say, I'm, I'm going to be explicit about the quantity of X's. And, and I could say, okay, well now, now X's is something I can use. So I can uncompress this list just by looking at the type and we're done. That would be a really bad idea though. Um, any, any, I mean, maybe you can guess why that's a really bad idea. But uh, this would be a really bad idea because I haven't actually compressed it anymore. I, I'm now carrying around the compressed version of the list and the original list. So the fact that this doesn't have a quantity on it means that it's available at runtime. So, so by having, uh, I'll get rid of that because uh, I'm not going to use it. Um, 
and um, we're in the right place now. Yeah. So, so the fact that we have these quantities means that we are we are constrained in what we can use at runtime, and just by looking at the type, we know what's going to be around at runtime, and we know what isn't. Um, Idris One has a, um, a really fancy mechanism for calculating what is used at a runtime. So, um, so done by my former PhD student uh, uh, Matush <laughs> Tejchak and. If I pronounce his surname anywhere close to right, it'll, it'll be a first. Um, it's a marvelous um, uh, algorithm. It, it, it works, but the problem is it's fragile. If you accidentally use something but you didn't mean to, suddenly you're leaking um, runtime data that you didn't mean to. So having having it um, in the type that something is unused um, turns out to be a, a really uh, handy thing to have. So there's no there's no um, there's no way out. We're just going to have to write this function. So we'll do a case split. Um, by the way, I, I think this function, the, the, the program generation should be able to write this function on its own. Uh, there's enough information in the type that there's only really one way to do this. At the moment, it can't. That makes me sufficiently sad that I'm going to work on it. I, I'm going to make this go. But for now, we have to do it ourselves. Um, so what happens if we uncompress the empty list? Well, that should be easy enough. Yes, it can do that. So uncompressing the empty list gives us the empty list. And uncompressing the, uh, the non-empty thing, well, that's going, to be, that's going to be n copies of x plus whatever the recursive call on, uh, gives us here. So um, I'm just going to do that. Uh, sorry, let's uh, val rec. So we have, to, we have to deconstruct it. So we have to, uh, so uncompressed will give us a, a singleton. We have, to, we have to pull the value out of that singleton. And um, <clears throat> so we're, we're, we're producing a singleton of rec nx plus plus rec. Surely the machine can find that for us. Yes, uh, thank goodness for that. Um, so we've, we've written uncompression. We've, uh, we've made sure that we're not storing that um, expanded list at runtime, so we have to calculate it, and that's giving us back. This is a guarantee that the list that we're getting back is the same list that we put in in the first place. Um, the time is running short, so for RLE. I've got a question for you. Yeah. Frederick has a question, and I need to ask it. Um, no, Mike, again. Does explicitly quantifying a type impact type erasure? Uh, yes, that's in fact that's uh, that's exactly what it does. Um, so, if I were to so uh, the the choice of syntax here is that if you don't explicit if if you've got one of these um, implicitly bound names so x is here and you don't say anything else about it you haven't written anything else about it then it's erased. It's given quantity zero. So if you want to give um, an implicit type variable. Um, a quantity other than zero, you have to say what it is, or you, you have to explicitly write it down. So this will give us um, an x's with an unrestricted quantity. So if we don't give a quantity in a, in a binding like this, um, then, um, then it's unrestricted. Uh, and we can also give it a zero if, uh, so in this case, this is, this, this, what I've written here, zero x's of some type, that's equivalent to what I wrote without writing this explicitly. Oh, and by the way, this is, this is a case where, um, uh, where, where we have to infer a type that's not type. So they're not automatically, they're not aut automatically uh, abstracting over types here. They could be whatever makes sense in the context. So it will infer from the context what that should be. So I hope that answers the question. And uh, I mean, I, I do actually want to run this. And, and I, if I did, Someday I would work through RLE, but it's um, I think it's out of my taste buff now. So um, yeah, here's one I made earlier, and um, let's just show that it does. Now. I haven't actually run any programs yet, and this it's a, it's an easy trap to fall into. I'll just fall into it again um, to um, um, to say, oh well, it type checks, so you know, ship it. Um, whereas it'll be better if I uh, let's. Uh, Let's show you what it does. So, uh, that'll do. Um, that won't do because where is it? There it is. Okay, that's what that's what we'd hope to get. So three A's followed by four B's, and then 
from compressing that, it gives us uh, the list we started with. So, great. We can evaluate functions as well as write. Isn't that exciting? Right. Um, this is a point to go back to slides. A good point for a short break if anyone has any more questions. Because uh, I want to take a short interlude just to talk about Idris 2 itself. But um, I'm guessing from the silence that uh, there are no questions at the moment. Um, I'm watching the chat and I will uh, let you know if any pop up. Okay. Um, so I just want to say a little bit about Idris 2 itself. Uh, this is partly because a, a lot of what I've been doing over the last year or so has been rewriting Idris. And I want to say a bit about why and a bit about the things I've learned on the way. So I'll only spend a couple of minutes on this. So um, Idris 1 had got to a point where, you know, we, I didn't really know what I was doing when I started writing it because, you know, there's not a lot of experience at the time of, of writing dependently typed programming languages. So, and, and I didn't really have much experience of writing an actual programming language of any form. So there's a lot of fumbling around and, and some design decisions turned out to be bad ones, but they were, they were okay. We could live with them because we weren't really doing anything big. We were just trying out, you know, what can you do with dependently type programming? What kind of problems can we solve? But then it, it kind of started creaking at the edges a bit. It was becoming increasingly obvious that if we wanted to scale it up to anything, we need to do a bit of re-engineering. And I was thinking, I want to write a bigger program in Idris to show that, uh, to show that you can. And you know, we've now got to a point where I don't really know how to write anything other than a compiler. So all putting all of these things together, it, maybe it's a good idea to, to have a crack at implementing Idris in itself. At the same time, um, so Conor McBride and Bob Atkey had come up with uh, QTT, quantum bit type theory. Uh, and I saw that as a really nice way of describing erasure in a in a type-driven way. Well, okay, let's put these things, two things together. Let's implement Idris again in itself. Let's implement it using quantitative types, and let's just see how far we get. Um, so Idris 2 is now implemented in itself. So what I did was implement it in Idris 1, and then essentially over a weekend, just go through the bits where Idris 1 thought, so in Idris 1, we weren't being explicit that something was needed at runtime in Idris 2, we had to be. So essentially, that's, that's the only difference that we had to worry about. Um, so I ported it to Idris 2, and to my astonishment, it actually worked. Uh, so now we have this system that's implemented in itself. Which is a lovely thing to have, because it means every time you try a, a new thing with the runtime, or a new thing uh, with the type checker, or I maybe change some bit of the, the, the core of the system, I have this ginormous test suite already in the form of it has to still be able to compile itself. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how often that's caught problems uh, early. Um, but also, we've, so I mentioned this thing when I was talking about RLE, that, that, that you, you can go um, a long way with the kinds of properties you can express. And I spent quite a bit of time trying to decide what kinds of properties I should use the type system to express. So just not many the same as in Haskell and write it just like Haskell with a little bit extra, or do I go full on prove the correctness of the compiler? Um, now, neither of those extremes I think would make sense. We've gone somewhere in the middle. And uh, what we've ended up with is the core representation of programs is parameterized by the names that are in scope, the variable names that are in scope. So um, probably uh, several people in the audience have had some experience of playing around with representations of, of Lambda calculus. And you probably found that representation of names is one of the most annoying things to get right. And it was certainly the, um, the source of a number of errors in Idris 1. And the great thing is in Idris 2, those errors simply can't happen <laughs> unless, unless we have kind of two levels of bugs, I suppose, where, where a bug in Idris 2 causes us not to spot a thing that is a bug in Idris 2. But, you know, bearing, uh, bearing in mind that sort of, um, uh, possibility. That kind of error can't happen. Another kind of error that can't happen is in Idris 2, every program or every function has to be covering by default, so covering all inputs by default. Um, so we can't have missing cases uh, unless we uh, unless we turn off, you know, there's, it's, it's always a good idea to leave, a, leave an escape hatch for a programmer, but we haven't used it. Um, so there's, there's, there's uh, so every program, it, it will complain if a program doesn't cover um, all of the possible inputs. That means that if there is any kind of input where 
uh, we maybe don't know what to do. Or we're, we're very tempted to say, oh, this can't happen. Well, we can't do that. We can't make that assumption. We have to, we have to come up with some, um, some explanation of what happened in that situation. It usually turns out it's, it's to report an error. So that means that Idris 2 isn't going to crash because of a user error. It may crash because of a system error, like a file not existing or even like a, a, a user interrupt. But it's not going to crash because there's a missing case in a function definition. Again, you know, modulo bugs, there may be bugs, but um, we've certainly massively increased our confidence that that kind of error isn't going to happen. So it's implemented uh, or compiled via Shea scheme. So Idris 1 compiled to C using a runtime that I'd written. And just as a, as a let's just hack this up quickly, I want to have a compiler. I thought, compile to scheme. Scheme doesn't have um, compile time type checking, so I can be completely free in the kind of code I generate. And um, pleasingly, it turns out that uh, Shea scheme is significantly faster than my hacked up C runtime. So this is basically what happens if you have your runtime written by someone who is experienced at writing runtimes, shock, turns out it's a good runtime. So um, Idris 2 programs run significantly faster than Idris 1 programs. Um, scheme, you might think, well, it's a dynamically typed language, so surely it's got to do runtime checking, and you've done those runtime checks. And this is true. Pleasingly, Shea Scheme has an option to turn off those runtime checks. So we do that, and that, that gets us like another 30% speed up. So Shea Scheme has turned out, most uh, kind of stroke of good fortune, has turned out to be a great way of, of, of compiling it. So you can install Idris 2 just by installing Shea Scheme, and then we distribute the, the generated Shea Scheme, and you can, uh, uh, you can build it that way. So it's uh, relatively quick to build, as I say, it's about, about an order of magnitude faster than Idris 1. And uh, I can, can give you, uh, if, you've, if you've played around with Idris 1, you probably run into this frustration that, it's, that it's, it starts feeling sluggish really quickly. And I, um, I just want to give you a feel for um, how much better it is. So we've got it quite happily building itself here. Um, if you're a Go programmer or even a C programmer, you're probably thinking, wow, that's incredibly slow. But the thing you need to bear in mind watching it build this is that not only is it um, sort of type, type checking the thing, you're also getting these guarantees. So it's uh, that, um, that all the names are in scope, that all the functions are covering all of the possible inputs um, and so on. Uh, so that'll take about, takes about a minute. Anyway, so that's um, implementing Idris 2. And I say this for well, two reasons. Firstly, I want to advertise um, uh, a summer school that's coming up. So free registration. Um, it's the Scottish Programming Language and Verification Summer School. And it's online, so you don't have to come to Scotland uh, to do this. So there's several interesting courses. But I'm going to be explaining some of the internals of how um, Idris 2 works. And I'll say the reason, the other reason I want to tell you about this is that uh, there's a lot of stuff to do, and I'd really like more people to know how the internals work, so that I don't have to, uh, I don't have to fix all of the stuff. So, um, so I'm very happy for people to come and report uh, any issues that you encounter, but I'm super extra happy if not only do you come with the report of the issue, but you come with some idea how to fix it. And I'd love to get more people um, in that position. Um, okay, so um, I've been talking for a very long time, so uh, I'll, I'll talk for a little bit longer because I, I do want to do this. Um, the, the thing that I, um, the, the thing that I'm enjoying about having quantitative types is that quantitative types, particularly linearity, allows me to express things that had previously been really awkward to express in types. So a kind of problem I've been interested in for a while now is, is dealing with external resources. So um, types typically, uh, they're very nice at explaining what kinds of inputs uh, a function can take. So they're, they're, they're nice for explaining functional properties of things, but they're not necessarily so great for expressing non-functional properties, like resource usage properties. And I've been interested for a long time in how to express resource usage properties and types so that you're, you're, you're expressing not only what can happen or what, what kind of inputs are allowed, but when those inputs are allowed and when those operations are allowed to run. And the way I've been typically handling this 
is by writing um, a, a state monad that is uh, parameterized by the state of the system, so the input state and the output state, and how the output state is computed from the result of an operation. And this works. You can, you can absolutely express all kinds of interesting systems in this, but they don't compose. So if you have, if you have two things with some states and you want to put them together, well, good luck. You're just going to have to do that by hand. And this, this I found really disappointing. Came up with all kinds of <laughs> increasingly complicated ways of, of managing to deal with that. And then QTT comes along and I think, I don't have to do these. I don't have to write a, an index statement on that anymore. I can just write linear functions. So I'm going to illustrate that with um, the simplest example I could think of, which is a, a, a data store. It's kind of unrealistic. Well, I don't know, it's a, it's a very cut down realistic thing. Um, so our data store, our secure data store, we've got two states that we're in. We're either logged out, so that's where we start, or we're logged in. There's a secret in that data store that we can read, um, and we can log in, I guess, us into the logged in state, log out, guess us into the logged out state. But the tricky thing is that we can't just call the login operation and expect to be in the logged in state. So when we do these, um, when, when we represent these machines, we have to consider that as programmers, we're not fully in control of the environment that we're working in. So we're not fully in control of where the login succeeds. We might give the wrong password or the system might be down or any, any kind of other reason where it might go wrong. So we're going to, we're going to do this as, as uh, we're going to represent this system as a linear type system. We're going to write a program that works through the states of the system. So, wow, one minute fifty-six. It's usually about one minute, so that shows you how much uh, Zoom is uh, <laughs> taking up. Um, <clears throat> right. So, uh, where is it? Did I just did I close my Vim window? That was silly. And let's open it again. It was silly because I had all the fonts set up the right size. Um, I think 32 was the secret number. Good, that'll do. Uh, right, so, so this is how we might represent that kind of system uh, as a linear type system. So uh, we'll, you just have to imagine that this is connecting to them, some uh, external service. This is a bit of a, a mock-up. The important thing is the types of the operations. So one thing about uh, quantities is that quantities are on binders only. So we can't um, easily put quantities on the return type of an operation. So that's, that's a question of like design of the core theory. It's the design that, that they chose for QTT. Everything works out nicely that way. So I've picked it that way. We'll just have to, we'll just have to live with it. So that means that if we want to make a new thing that is only to be used once, the way to do it is, is, is in this kind of continuation passing style. So, so we're gonna write a program that, that connects to some store, so it's some IO operation, but it, it takes as an argument this continuation that says, you, if you can write me a function that takes one logged out store and then ends up as an IO program, then you have a you have a correct implementation of your store usage protocol. So this is the only way of making a store, is what I'm saying. So the fact that this is the only way of making a store means that every store we have is going to be exactly one of it. So we can do all of these things that I showed in the diagram. Uh, log out is probably the easiest type to look at first. So that takes a store that's logged in and it returns a store that's logged out. Now, remember the uh, the rule that uh, if if you've got some linear thing and you pass it to a function, the rule is that if that function is used once, then the linear thing is used once. Um, that does have some implications for the way we, we use this. We're only ever going to be able to use this log out function, or given that it takes uh, a linear thing, and given that we have the only the only stores we'll ever have will be linear, then calls to log out are not going to type check unless we're using them in a linear context, which means that the store that comes out is also going to be linear. Um, so again, I'll work through that again by an example, but 
this is why we don't it's just to say this is why we don't need to worry about the the quantity of the store that's returned is that we'll only ever be able to use this in a linear context so the most complicated type is the one of login so um so it takes a logged out store and a password and we won't necessarily get a, a logged in or logged out store back and i've done this by returning um a pair so this res type this is a this is a dependent pair where the first thing is just some value that we're returning. And then the second thing is a type that we're going to compute from whatever that first thing, the result of that first thing is. So I could return an either here. So either store logged out, store logged in. Um, but this way of doing it is, is much more flexible. So returning a store and if the, re if it's, if the B, if the result is okay, then it's logged in, otherwise it's logged out. So let's just write that program. Um, so it's always good to do these incrementally just by saying, you know, help me out here. What have we got? So I've got a store that's logged out and um, uh, I need to somehow get to IO. So basically I, I'm only gonna get through this if I manage to discard this store. So, um, in fact, I can, I can discard it by calling disconnect, but let's, let's, let's try to connect it first. So we can call, we can try to log into the store. So, um, so this res type, we don't actually know what this res is, and I'm not gonna tell you quite yet. I'm, I'm just gonna assume it exists. And we're gonna try uh, logging in. What are we gonna guess for the password? Let's, let's go with that one. And um, see if that does anything. So that's told us that, you know, great, we've, we've, we've tried to log in and our res, well, it's the result, which is a bool and this other thing. So I could, at this point, I guess I could look up the documentation for res, but uh, it's rather more fun just to blunder on and see, you know, if, I, I guess it's a, it's a data type. So I guess we could, uh, I guess we could pattern match on it and, and see where we go. So let's do that. Uh, so we've got, I've got a shortcut for making a case block. I, I'll do anything to avoid typing, so we've got a shortcut for doing that. And uh, if, so th there was a question earlier about what does it mean to use something? So this is what it means, this is one example of what it means to use something. So res had, had linear usage, um, and uh, this res, we've now put it in a case, so it's been used. And it has a result, which is a case val, which has not been used. We, need to, we can look at the types here. Um, so we now have one case val. So this, this thing, that the result of the case split is a case val. And the res has now, it's now been spent. So we can still talk about it, but it's been spent. And my favorite way to illustrate exactly what's going on here, just to get some kind of intuition in your mind, is um, it's, it's 7 p.m. here now, so I think the sun is over the yard arm. I like to illustrate through the medium of St. Andrew's Yippie IPA. So I have one of these. This is my, this is my resource. And I can do a, a case split on the resource. So this is, this is what I'm let binding to. And by doing a case split on the resource, so I now have, so no, let's not spill it in the interest of, so this is, this is now empty. I have zero of these, but I can still talk about it. It's still available. It's still in the context. And I have one of these and by doing kind of whatever kind of disposal, so whatever kind of analysis on this, I will end up having none of these. Um, I'm going to leave that alone for now uh, for two reasons. Firstly, if I finish the protocol, the talk is over, and that'll be bad. And secondly, that's a Scottish beer, and it needs to warm up before uh, before I can drink it. Um, probably some people wondering whether that's a joke or not. I'm not going to tell you. Right. So here's my. Uh, so what we'll do to find out what's going on, we've got a we've got a case value. We we don't know what res is. Let's have a look at what res is, and it says, ah, you've got a you've got a vowel and an r. I'll take a look at what they are. I mean, this is this is the process. This is the this is the process of interactive type driven editing. Is that at every step, make one step towards the program, refine the program a little bit, then ask the machine what it knows. Ask the machine if it can help you some more. So this whole 
<laughs> well, I've, I've now got some resource R. Uh, I know the type of that resource is what, if it's, if, if the value is true, then it's logged in, otherwise it's logged out. So that's kind of a hint that, um, that, that if I want to make any progress with this store, then, then I'm going to have to look at what val is. I'm, I'm going to have to inspect this value. So um, a general principle or a general thing that happens a lot in dependently typed programming is looking at one thing can tell you about the type of another thing. So we've, just by looking at the context here, we can say that looking at the value of this mysterious val, that can tell us uh, what, uh, what the type of the store is going to be. So I'm going to rename that S. I'm going to put an S before. Do a case split on this. So in this first case, uh, the result was true. We have a logged in store, so we can make progress. In the second case, we have a logged out store. It didn't work, it failed, and I guess something we could do is, in this case is, uh, is give up. Does that work? Good. Um, so again, I, I, I'm not going to work through this whole protocol. I just want to show you the, the basic idea of, of how you progress through a protocol. And I do, <laughs> as before, here's one I made earlier. I picked a different password earlier. Um, so, so this is um, an example of, of the whole thing. So we, so we have to work through this protocol. If I try, for example, if I try not disconnecting, if I forget to disconnect and then, and then return it, it will say, well, you didn't, you didn't use that linear name. There's no uses of it. You didn't finish the protocol. Therefore, I'm not going to let you quit yet. So, so what we've been able to do here is encode an API uh, and encode the state transitions and particularly encode when we're allowed to do things by using quantities in, in types. And just a little bit of, of dependent typing going on to, um, uh, to, to, to refine this type according to, to some results. Um, so it's worth pointing out actually if, um, uh, let's, let's go back, let's put a hole back here. Um, we could have returned um, an either type, so either store logged in or store logged out. One reason why we might not want to do that is that um, it might be, uh, so, oh, uh, let's, let's do it here. I'm not going to run this program, so it's fine. Um, Okay, let's not faff about too much. I haven't even drunk the beer yet. <laughs> right, that's where that's that's still not where I wanted to be. Anyway, the, 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 <laughs> let's let's not labour this. Uh, the the point is, you might want to do some operation on the store. There might, there might be some operation that you can do without actually knowing its state. So, for example, you might have a a ping operation. You might want to know whether the store is alive or not. And you might want to do that independently of whether you know it's logged in or not. So you might want to do that before you, you test the results of the operation, for example. So it just allows you that, that little bit more flexibility. Uh, right, one last example, and then, then I think I'll stop. Is, 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 as an example that um, I think uh, really does come up when, you, when you're designing a, with a, a new language, it's, it's good to think about um, what the facilities of that language might allow you to do in your standard APIs. So um, one that, uh, that comes up in everyday programming is, is uh, network sockets. So uh, network socket programming is, um, I find it a little bit fiddly myself. There's, a, there's an API for this that, uh, that they, they have to, in order to get a socket up and running, to uh, a server socket up and running, you have to say, well, I'll bind it to a port. I'll start listening for connections. When I get a connection, I'll accept that connection. That gives me a new socket that's now open. Um, and it's, it's not represented in this diagram, but that listening socket is still going. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of state transitions going on. And each of these operations might fail because um, maybe some of some external resource, maybe there's maybe you're out of memory, maybe there's maybe you're not, not able to bind to the port because something else is on that port, and so on. So all of these things might go wrong. And if you're writing, um, if you're writing a program on sockets uh, in everyone's favorite typed programming language, C, you get this um, nice typed API 
that tells you um, tells you what it is you have to do. So we create a socket, and um, we know what to give for the main type and protocol because they're all ints. So there you go, and that returns an int. Uh, that re that int is the um, ID of the socket. I think it also represents whether it went wrong. So uh, there's a lot of ints going on here. So it's it's useful to think about which of those. You know, some of these are representing error cases, and some of them are representing actual sockets. So just to give a bit of help. Um, the blue ones, um, so this one, this one, this one, and so on, this one and this one, these are representing uh, the socket ID. And then uh, these ones, these red ones, they're representing possible errors. So the int, that's, uh, the int that's being returned is kind of doing a double duty in some cases. So some of these ints are representing sockets, some are representing errors. So these are the primitives that we have to work with. And um, so I'm, I'm not mocking C here because it's this is a 1970s technology. It's uh, and it, it's a natural. It's like the low-level way to do it, which is fine. But if you've got a higher-level language, it's good to think about how you might give a higher-level API to that. So Idris has uh, its network primitives. So it's a little bit more informative. I've, I've simplified this slightly because uh, we're not using uh, so we've, we've abstracted over I/O. But we can at least say that what these ints mean that these ints have an actual meaning and the operations might return an error. So it's either an error or a socket, or in this case, it's just a result code, or in this case, it's uh, accepts. Is, so when you accept a connection, you get the initial socket that you had and you get a new socket that is the socket that you do the communication on. Uh, so we're a little bit more informative here. Oh, and also we're saying that um, we have to make a choice about what to do about errors. So the address runtime um, doesn't have exceptions. Uh, this is a deliberate choice. This is um, this is because we want we want errors to be explicit in the type. So this is a language for type-driven programming. It makes sense to you know if there is a choice, should I put a thing in the type or should I not put a thing in the type? If there's any doubt at all, I should put the thing in the type. So it's perfectly possible to implement a, an exception uh, API on top of this. So in fact, in the implementation of Idris 2, we have uh, sister or um, user errors are done using an exception implementation and low level system errors are done just using this form. But yeah, we have to make that choice. So we've been explicit in the type. Um, so what it actually is in the primitives is, is we say uh, this IO, uh, this, is, this is an interface. So if you're a Pascal programmer, you'll think of that as a, as a type class. And then this using notation, this is just a shorthand that allows us to say anywhere you see IO in this block, it needs to be, uh, it needs to have an implementation of this interface as IO. So in Haskell terminology, it needs to have an implement, uh, it had, needs to, there needs to be an instance of has IO, uh, the has IO type class. Um, so it's only slightly simplified, but just think of this as IO. Now, really, what we'd want to do, though, that, that that's that's capturing errors. So it's capture and it's capturing what the things might do and how they might go wrong. What it's not capturing is when things are allowed to happen. So it's capturing what what happens, but it's not capturing when things happen. I'd really like to somehow express that I can only call bind on a socket that's closed, and I can only call listen on a socket that's banned, uh, and so on. So. Um, so without going into all of the details of, of what this mysterious L is, well, I'll, I'll, I will say it's a, it's a monad transformer that turns a monad into something, into a linear monad. That's, that's all I'll say about it. In practice, what it allows us to do is say how many times the result of the operation gets to be used. So bind takes a linear socket in the ready state, and it returns something that I have to use exactly once, and it's one of these res again. It's it's, it's a pair of a, a result and a socket that's either closed or bound, depending on whether that operation succeeded. Uh, close is a bit simpler. It's a socket in any state. So I, I um, just made that choice that, that you can call close at any you can give up at any point. So this is this is another reason, by the way, why we don't return either for errors. We return this. Uh, we return just some arbitrary expression because I, I couldn't pass an either to this. I'd have to resolve which one it was. Here I can just pass the socket, whatever state it's in, even if I don't know the state. And in that case, it'll give us a closed socket back. And then once we're done, we, we can only discard the socket once it's done. And the other operations follow the same uh, form as this, uh, this bind operation. 
So um, just see what that looks like in in, in, a, in a real program. So I, I wrote um, an, an echo server that, that all it's going to do is 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 start up a server and then it's going to um, receive a message and it's going to send a message back. So what we have to do again, I'm not going to do this um, in full because it'll take too long, and you've already been very patient with me. So um, so what we'll do is. Um, run the operation and then see what state has come back uh, from the socket. So a problem with like, let's, you have to make this choice about how to deal with errors. And there, there's all sorts of pros and cons of, do I return uh, uh, an error code or do I throw an exception or do I return a type that indicates an error? Uh, so the problem with having to re uh, returning the type that indicates an error is that you have these massively nested case blocks um, and you don't really want to have the massive, you know, you'd be far off to the right of the screen. So um, Idris provides this um, uh, pattern matching uh, do notation. So you, you might see something like this if, if you program in Haskell, that you can run an operation and then bind the result of uh, this, uh, I think Haskell calls them irrefutable patterns. So if it's true, then we'll just carry on down the happy path. Uh, Idris allows you additionally to say what to do in the other cases. So it's, it's like we've programmed to the happy path, but because we have some coverage checking and because we need to, we need to clean up with whatever state the socket is in, we need to somehow get to the right state. We, we have the, these um, alternative paths. So if anything goes wrong, we, we go into the, the pattern matching alternative. And so in this case, you'll see that um, if binding succeeded, uh, then we have a closed socket. Sorry, if binding failed, we have a closed socket. If it succeeded, then we have a bent socket. So uh, this, by the way, uh, I don't know if any Perl programmers in the audience. I used to be a Perl programmer. Uh, this, this is. I, I saw this this idiom in Perl where you sort of open a file or die, and I saw that uh, that idiom throughout, and I thought oh, that would actually get me out of this problem of the massively nested uh, case box without having to. Um, without having to uh, introduce exceptions. So I find this a, a reasonable way to work. And then you know, the rest of the program, the rest of the program. I'm gonna leave that, um, I'm gonna leave that bad hole in there. Does it, does it type check? No, it doesn't, because um, it needs to the brackets. Okay, so that's type checked. We've got this hole, but um, I don't care. Uh, so uh, don't care for now. I'm just going to show you what happens when we try uh, running that. Oh, I need to tell it. Uh, oh, I need now. Let's do it the way I tested rather than making something up. Uh, just to say what this is, uh, iPackage is a way of describing the contents of a package. And if, if you say find iPackage, it will just find the one in the current directory that tells it what dependencies it needs. So there's there are different there are dependencies for the linear I.O. and dependencies for the network. Uh, anyway, so we have a program, do I have a program? Yeah, run echo just starts up that server uh, and runs it. Um, and it says uh, warning compiling whole main dot bad. So as long as we don't, so I, I do this just to show that you can, you can run incomplete programs. Um, realistically, the majority of programs you're ever working with are incomplete in some way. Certainly if you're a developer, they're incomplete in some way. And I don't want to stop you being able to test what those programs do uh, if you haven't finished them. Uh, in this case, <laughs> thankfully, the server has started, so it didn't encounter that hole. If it does encounter that hole, it will just crash uh, at runtime. So, so it's um, it's okay to do that, but obviously, you need to if you, if you want to ship it, then it's a good idea to to, to, to fill them all in. Um, so let's let's actually try telnetting to them. Um, there we go. So just to prove that it is an, an echo server, it is doing something. And uh, actually, I guess I only really prove that uh, it's it's my server doing something if um, if I shut it down and it doesn't work. So let's let's just do that. Very good. Uh, um, okay, I haven't left any points to ask questions. Maybe, maybe everyone's gone for dinner. Uh, does anyone have any questions at that point? 
We have a number of questions, actually. Oh. Um, some of them are general sorts of questions. Uh, will you take anything right now, or do you want to wait until um, the end for the let's, general let's ones? Do, if there's any specific ones, let's do the specific ones, but, but let's go to the general ones um, in a moment. Um, I don't know if there's anything that's relevant to what you're talking about right now. Oh, well, let's go general then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, nobody has a mic today, apparently, so I have to ask uh, most of them. So uh, actually, there's a question relevant to the interlude that you did from Christian. And he's curious, are you at a point where you'd welcome new code generators for, uh, for example, Beam, C, et cetera, as contributions? So there is already um, an Erlang code generator rather than Beam. So the way, I'm going to take the same approach as, as uh, say, I'm going to take this as, as several of us working on it, uh, as, as we did with this one, which is that we'll have a couple of built-in things. So the problem with having lots of code generators is as soon as they're in the Idris 2 system, I have some kind of obligation to at least know how they work and at least be able to do minimal maintenance on them. And I, I can't do that beyond a, a, just a couple. So we have, um, we export Idris as an API. So you can, you can link to, um, you can link to the whole system. And you can write a driver that adds your own code generator. Um, it's sort of a relatively easy thing to do. And, and I, I encourage people to do that. And there's a few already out there. So there's, a, there's a, an Erlang one out there. Um, there's a special secret effort to work on the OCaml runtime, which is making some good progress. It's actually, uh, amusingly, it's only slightly faster than Shea Scheme, which um, just shows you how good Shea Scheme is, because OCaml's fast. Um, so there's so, so definitely do that. Um, we we have the same philosophy that that um, you know platform. So you just because you're running on a particular platform doesn't mean you should have to write programs in the language of that platform. So just because you're running on the web, that shouldn't mean that you have to write your programs in JavaScript. It it should be possible to write it in you know, whatever language you like. Maybe you have to run on the JVM for whatever reason. So, so Idris will, the, the language itself, like the internals of the language is agnostic about the, the target and that there's, there's ways of, of writing foreign function calls to have multiple calling conventions to say, or if you're on the JVM, do this. If you're, if you're native, do that. So, so there's not going to be any big assumptions made about the runtime. So, I mean, that, that's a really long way of saying, yeah, go ahead and do it. It'll be cool. Okay, Idris in the browser. I'm going to be waiting for that as a uh, yeah, well, developer. That, that is a JavaScript uh, backend that is, is that one actually is part of um, the, uh, the main Idris 2 repo. And uh, I haven't tried it yet, but um, <laughs> the tests pass, so you know. <laughs> so it could be, could be good enough for front end work then. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to commit because I haven't tried it, but. Give it a go. I mean, this, this is always, you, know, you have to remember, uh, people keep forgetting this, I think. Idris is, at the end of the day, it's, it's got research funding behind it. So it's, it's a research project. I, I work at a university. I'm grateful for the funding I get from six, uh, so that's the Scottish Informatics Computer Science Alliance, from EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. But otherwise, it's, um, you know, that, that's, that's all we have. We're not a big team of uh, of developers, so um, it might work, it might not. But if you try and it doesn't work, the best way to make it work is to get your hands dirty. And I'm going to, I mean, the, the fact that we've been able to implement Idris 2 in itself says at least something. It doesn't tell you very much, but it tells you something. It tells you it can scale to that sort of level. I think the JavaScript backend, if, if it compiles to Node rather than in the browser, I think it's got enough to be able to compile, to, to run Idris 2 in JavaScript. Not tremendously efficiently, but, um, but it does work. So that, that gives you an idea of, of where you're at. So if, if your backend can compile Idris, then you've pretty much got it uh, working. But do, always bear that in mind that, uh, you know, you probably have to get your hands dirty if you're doing anything other than what I've done. <laughs> kind of on that point, I'm just curious what your vision is for Idris. You're, you actually are showing some very practical examples now. And um, 
I'm wondering if you have a similar kind of uh, avoid success at all costs philosophy, or you could actually see Idris someday being used in production, or it is, uh, strictly speaking, um, a research project. Um, so let's, uh, so, so <laughs> I guess we, we all know about the two different bracketings of avoid success at all costs. Um, I would bracket that as avoid success at all costs. So being a research project, so we, I, I'm, <laughs> I write papers about Idris, I don't necessarily get them accepted, but at least I write them, uh, which means that I'm trying to do things the right way. So I'm not going to, I mean, there was an early stage where I was taking various shortcuts just to see how things might work out, but I'm not, not going to do that anymore. It, just, it has to work the right way. So it's not about, um, you know, taking shortcuts to get success or, or just leaving, uh, really cutting corners uh, to, yeah, to, to, to have some success. At the same time, if people do want to use Idris for something real, um, I'm certainly happy to help out. Um, I, there, are, there are people using Idris for real uh, in industry where I'm helping out. Um, but you know, I can only help out one person at a time or one team at a time. So it's, um, this, 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 this doesn't necessarily scale. Um, so, the, so what is the vision? Um, <laughs> my goal is in some sense to optimize for fun. So I'm going to work on the corners of the, of the, the, the programming language design problems that I find most entertaining while still bearing in mind that uh, programming language research exists for a reason. It exists because people have a problem that they actually want to solve. And I think the next thing that is going to be, that there's going to be the right balance of interesting, fun, and important is this program synthesis. So you only really got a taste of it here. And Idris only really does a, a, a tiny bit of it. But um, it's, so if there is one philosophy that uh, kind of covers the whole thing is or what one one overall problem grand problem that we're trying to solve is how do you make it cheaper to make software that works and be confident that you have made software that works i think type systems help you do that because type systems move uh, more of the understanding what the program does and as, as, as compared to what it's supposed to do moves that sort of thing to the machine this is something that machines are extremely good at doing they're extremely good at checking whether something fits a specification. They're not really so good at generating something that fits a specification. A human might look at something and say, yeah, that, that is, that, that's the program I want to write. So, you, you're, so your program synthesis can give you a little bit of help as to generating the program. You look at it and think, yeah, that's probably the program I want. But the machine, has a, the machine knows that that program type checks. So, Using what the machine knows to help you write a program that works, be confident that that program works, but you still have some kind of input into what that program is supposed to be. That's sort of my goal for how you might reduce the cost of writing correct software and have some fun at the same time. I feel like I should edit that down into like two sentences because that felt very rambly, but um, there you go. That's the no, that was, that was interesting to hear, honestly. Um, I have a few more general questions if you like. Uh, sure, go for it. I mean, I'm, I'm now on the summary slide, and I, I do have more. So I, I, I promised concurrency, but then I realized that if I was going to do concurrency, I'd have to spend the entire talk setting it up. Um, well, should we do the summary and then come back to the general questions? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've basically said the summary uh, just there, but the, the, the thing that I want to highlight is this idea of programming as a conversation, um, partly because um, we have a new project that's just started. So. Uh, uh, Guillaume Mallet is uh, working with me on, on this project for how do we make programming uh, more like a conversation with the machine? How do we make it more interactive? And, uh, but with, with like sound um, theoretical foundations. So, so what is the language of interaction with the machine? And um, I, think the, the, I think the answer to that is elaboratory reflection. So better meta programming, better ways of um, kind of programming the programmer. So uh, when I show you these uh, program search, what I'm doing there is uh, I'm doing a case split and then I'm doing a search. And if that doesn't work, I do another case split and then a search. And that's not far off what I'm sometimes doing when I'm exploring um, what it means to solve a problem. So this, 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 this project, programming being a conversation, is to some extent about programming the machine to be a programmer. Um, 
using algorithms rather than, and when I say algorithms, um, I mean algorithms. I don't mean heuristics. I don't mean machine learning. I mean, I mean being able to really explain what it means to write a program from a type. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what it's all about. That's, that, that's where we're going here. Um, so what do we do with that? Um, so session types is a fun problem to solve in that space. So session types are a way of describing concurrent processes. Um, so they're describing the messages get, that get passed by concurrent and distributed protocols. So how do you guarantee that that, um, um, uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that you have an implementation of the protocol that is correct according to the specification? And crucially, what happens if you change the protocol? So everything I'm showing you here has been about how do you write the program in the first place? I haven't really said anything about what happens when the types change? What, what about maintenance? So I think there's a lot to be said in the interactive editing space and the interactive development space of the refactoring, basically. What, what, can, what can types do to help refactoring? And uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, you know, that, that's, that's kind of all I have to say. Types are a lot of fun. Adding quantities to types makes them even more extra fun. And um, please come and have fun with us. So um, yeah, I'll stop there. I'll move on to questions. And I think, I think this is now warm enough to drink. Cheers. Yeah, I have to say you're horrifying oh. the Germans in the audience by drinking yeah. warm beer. Oh, that was deliberate. <laughs> um, um, well, I, let me... I was umming and ahhing about whether to have the beer. I was like, oh, that's terribly unprofessional. And I thought, yeah, but I could do the warm beer thing. And that really be fun. It humanizes you. <laughs> Um, before moving on to questions, let me just thank you for the talk. I actually find that uh, as much as it's nice to be together in person to do these meetups, one of the advantages of the format here is we can kind of follow along with you as you, as you code and as you work much more closely. And that's really interesting. That's really um, fun to see. Uh, I'm really glad you did that. Thank you uh, so much for the, uh, the insight into how you're thinking and how you're working through the problems interactively. Yeah, and there's a lot of trade-offs in all of this, but from my point of view, everybody might have left and I'm none the wiser. It's marvelous. <laughs> so, uh, no, you, you kept an audience of 30-some-odd uh, people for the entire time. Right, well, thank you all for saying. So Frederick has a question. How does Idris-flavored linearity inform garbage collection? Ah, that is a great question because um, I have another student who, who is working on just this problem. Now, the, the, um, the, the, the annoying thing is that it doesn't really at first because, um, so as I mentioned about three hours ago when we began, uh, the Idris quantities only promise that things aren't going to be shared in the future. They don't promise that uh, things weren't shared in the past. So, so one thing we'd love to do, but can't easily, we, we'd love to be able to say, right, this, this function is inspecting a linear list. Uh, we've got uh, the head and the tail. If we're going to make another list, we can just reuse that head and the tail. That would be lovely. But we can't do that in general. What we can do, though, is the, the, the type checker knows when it creates a new value, it knows the, the quantity or the context uh, when it's creating it. So it knows whether it's creating it in a one, zero, or unrestricted context. And the runtime representation of constructors has a few spare bits. So you could use one of those bits to say, this thing was constructed in a linear context. You could do that at compile time. And then instead of splitting on uh, you know, the compilation saying this is nil or cons, you can say this is nil or cons, linear nil, linear cons. And in the linear branches, you can, you can use that information at runtime. Now, I don't really know how well that's going to work because um, obviously it has the cost of making the program much bigger. Um, and maybe there's some analysis we can do to say, oh, this is always linear. But um, uh, my uh, uh, master student, Andre Videla, has done some very promising initial experiments that suggest if everything lines up, this could be, being linear correct uh, could be a really big win because you're not allocating, you're not garbage collecting as much. But um, that, is, that is as yet unexplored, apart from this very small amount that, uh, that Andre has done. But I think it's very promising. Because it, it is, at the end of the day, it's, 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 an, it's an additional bit of compile time information. And let's see if we can use that additional bit of compile time information to do something useful. So other things we can do with that is um, 
you know, we, all, we can already do things like have a type that represents the fact that the test has been done. So we don't need to do the dynamic check again, as long as we're still hanging on to the proof. So that's one place where we can use types to improve performance. But this linearity thing, that's, that, that, that is one more thing. Again, that's a long way of saying I don't know, but we're working on it. <laughs> so, um. Thank you. KK asks, can you say a little bit about the origins of QTT? What made it a good fit for linear types in Idris? How does Idris's design compare to, say, linear Haskell or Rust even? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. I, um, so where QTT came from, that, that's essentially the, uh, um, the, 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 the amazing mind of Conor McBride, who, who wanted to solve this problem and essentially solved this problem, but for a small bug, which um, uh, which Bob Ackie found uh, and fixed. And part of the reason that, that, that QTT therefore became um, a good fit for Idris is the, um, I don't know, this, this, this is probably an unsurprising reason, is just that I've known Connor for a long time and he was uh, heavily involved in the supervision of my PhD and a lot of that involves thinking about erasure. And one of the things about QTT was let's stop doing erasure by ad hoc analysis. You know, however much we we show the correctness of those analyses, let's let's get it in the type. Let's work out a system that gets it in the type. Connor figured that out. Um, I picked it up off Connor. Uh, what made it a good fit is uh, really the, um, the, the the linearity side of it is is kind of a happy accident. It, it's it, it's not really linearity that was the thing uh, I was bothered about. The thing I've been bothered about basically all the time I've been interested in dependent types is how do you know what's there at runtime and how do you know what isn't? And, you know, I wrote a thesis on this or an analysis that uh, works out what to erase based on the types. And uh, I'm delighted to say that, uh, that, that my thesis is now completely the wrong way to do it because, um, because, Connor and Bob came up with a better way. So it's the fact that I was I was interested in uh, uh, in zero multiplicities, not so much that I was interested in one multiplicities. And now I can write that, so I use that run length encoding example. Uh, we used to use that run length encoding example as, uh, as, um, as a way of showing how tricky it was to think about erasure. Now I can use it as a way of saying how how clear it is to think about, I, I think it's clear, maybe people don't agree, but uh, um, how clear I think it is to, to, to say what's there at runtime and what isn't. So the linearity thing is just another thing that works in the same system. Um, and as for how it compares with Haskell, um, the intuition that you have for how linearity works in Haskell is exactly the same as the intuition you would have for how it works in Idris. The, uh, the difference is that they don't have the zero multiplicity, or at least as far as I know, they don't have the zero multiplicity. And to some extent, they don't have the need for the zero multiplicity. So in, in Haskell, you have this, you have the, the, the very distinct um, type language and value language, term language, program language, whatever you want to call it. Whereas in Idris, we have the same language for, for both, part of what makes types first class. Um, so we have this additional problem that we have to think about zero multiplicities that Haskell doesn't have. But other than that uh, difference, they're pretty much the same. Um, oh, one thing uh, Haskell does have, um, if I remember rightly, it's been, a, it's been a while since I looked at the uh, linear Haskell paper, but I, well, the first linear Haskell paper, is, is uh, I, they have, um, as I remember it, quantity polymorphism. So you can not only, so you're not only abstracting over types and values, you're abstracting over the possible quantities of things and you're able to do some manipulation with that. Um, I would like that. I, I would, um, that would, I think that would allow a lot more expressivity. The question is, well, it might come at a cost. It, it would potentially make libraries and APIs harder to think about. We have to think carefully about what went in the prelude. So, um, you know, adding new stuff to a type system isn't, you know, adding more stuff isn't, it's not necessarily free. It doesn't necessarily, like it gives you more things you can do, but it might give you more problems. So it remains to be seen what, um, uh, what the right way to, um, uh, to deal with that is. But um, actually another reason why, <laughs> the main reason why Idris doesn't have quantity polymorphism is uh, more that uh, 
I don't think uh, Bob has worked it out for, not as far as I'm aware, Bob has not worked it out for QGT. And um, my strength is in implementing type systems, not in proving them correct. So I'm going to wait for, uh, I'm going to wait for someone to figure out uh, the right way to do it before I, uh, before I dive into it. But yeah, they're very similar. They're, and, and the, the, the programs that I showed you actually, the, um, apart from that, uh, so the fact that I'm returning a pair of a Boolean and something computed from that Boolean, so that's that's kind of a small implementation detail. Both examples with the uh, the, the state um, the state of um, sockets and with uh, the data store, you can absolutely do those examples in Haskell. You don't actually need full dependent types to do those examples. De uh, dependent types make it, I think, a little bit more expressive what you can do with them. But you could you could do those in linear Haskell. Since the question also mentioned Rust, I've been trying to think. Oh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been trying to think of an intelligent question myself, and uh, uh, and I can't come up with one. I wanted to ask you something about the relationship between linear types and dependent types, because I always thought of Idris as that dependently typed language, and Rust as the linear type language. And here you're bringing them together, and I'm wondering how you would explain their relationship for for someone who is not as deep into the subject as as yourself. So, uh, so I, I don't really know an awful lot about Rust. Uh, I enjoy reading about it. I very often get Rust envy when I look at some of the some of the low level programs that they're writing and are able to, you know, make these pretty strong correcting statements about. So, um, so I would like more of that in Idris. But um, let's uh, oh let's let's massively oversimplify. Um, <laughs> Um, because that's all I can deal with when it comes to Rust. Um, so I think we can probably, or well, many of us will agree that shared immutable states is is a bad idea, and it's where it, it it's the one of the biggest sources of of where programs can go wrong. So Idris and Haskell and pure functional languages they remove the mutable bit of that whereas Rust removes the shared bit of that. Is that, a, is that a reasonable way of, maybe. I'll have to think about that a bit more. Um, but no, no, that's, 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 that's good, actually. I hadn't thought of it in quite those terms. But, no, but that, that helps. Say that uh, Idris is, is the dual to Rust in, in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, so we can add mutability, but if you add mutability in Idris, your types tell you that you've added mutability. And in fact, the implementation of Idris 2, I, I make no apology for this. The implementation of Idris 2 is extremely uh, mutable. There's a lot of mutable structures in there. And that's just because when you're, when you're type checking um, a dependently typed program, information doesn't all turn up at once. So, so you've got these implicit arguments. You don't know what the type is. You have to wait for things to show up before you can fill in those types. And you'll get, gradually you'll get more and more information. And it's just faster to do that um, with, with mutable types. But the types tell you, or the mutable structures, the types tell you that there's mutation going on. So you know that um, if there is some problem with mutation, you know, here's the red flag. This function has the red mutable flag. Um, so this is, this is where it might go wrong. Uh, and I guess likewise, Rust has, um, you know, from safe and uh, I, I assume, I don't actually know this. You can, I'm sure you can do shared mutable things in Rust, but uh, somehow. I'm, um, so yeah, there's, there, there's, there's the distinction. I, um, I think Rust has, um, so you've got, you've got ownership and borrowing and, and we don't have, um, we don't have this sense of borrowing in, in, in Idris. And sometimes I would like that. Like I'd like to be able to pass a linear thing to a function and say, um, I'm only lending that to you. It will still be available to me when, when you come back. So, um, so we need to, I need to figure out the rules for, for how that might work. Um, and it would basically be, you know, you can, you can case split on it, but you can't do anything that the thing can case split on, for example. Um, so it'd be nice to think about that. How, how, would we, how will we allow borrowing? It will make programs look a bit nicer. So, Yes, there's another distinction. Yeah, I suppose they're thinking a bit more about uh, memory and Rust, which is not something you would typically do in a functional right. programming language. Um, I, I think that, that there's <laughs> something that might be quite fun, actually. I only very briefly looked at this, but we, we talk about, uh, we can talk about erased things and we talk about unerased things. So we could say, 
I will show you with, um, with the run length encoding, you've got this relationship between the list and the run length encoded representation of the list. And the list that you've got, we had a, a zero multiplicity. Well, maybe a similar thing you could do is you could have, I don't know, an array of bits. And the meaning of that array of bits is determined by some other higher level type. Some other, you know, complex data structure. Let's say it's a, I don't know, a balanced tree. Um, but if the balanced tree has multiplicity zero, your array of bits has multiplicity unrestricted, so that you can maybe program in terms of the nice high level structure, but the thing that comes out at runtime is in term with the low level bit representation. I have no idea if that would work, how it would work, but it's pretty, pretty cool if it did. Um, with types showing you that the two things are essentially the same thing, but the runtime representation is cheap. Or, or the runtime representation is something that you can be precise about. Well, thank you. Uh, the point about sharing um, is informative. I think I probably, I, I, I personally concentrate on the immutable part. I never really think too much about the sharing part, but as you were saying, we're on this journey toward making programs more safe and more correct. And these are different parts of that. Right. And, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's probably hard to talk about differences between Idris and Rust. It's probably easier to look for the similarities. Well, understanding <laughs> linear, linear types versus dependent types, I, I think, is what I was curious about. It doesn't have to be specifically about Rust. Um, so, um, actually, this, this is a, um, I don't normally get around to mentioning this, but it's popped into my head, so I'm going to say it. Um, so having a core language with linear and dependent types, I'm going to make this outrageous claim that, you know, that there's your one true core language. Any, any language you want to implement is, um, you can do this with a core language that has dependent and linear types. And I partly say this sort of thing because it will annoy someone, they'll disprove it, and in doing so, they'll come up with something really cool. But the other, way I, the other reason I say it is that, there is that core language that was part of Idris and the way the system is structured. So you've got the high level language, then that, comp that kind of de -shuggers to an intermediate language that's just like the core construct. So it's um, pattern matching, uh, function application, uh, case box. So that is exposed as part of the API. And I think it would be quite fun to write a different surface language that's not this you know, language that looks a bit like Haskell only strict um, and is otherwise a functional language. Instead of doing that, let's have a surface language that, that instead emphasizes the linearity and becomes an imperative language with dependent types, with the linearity making sure that things are only used in the right state. And sometimes, you know, when I'm out for a wander and letting my brain go to odd places, I start thinking about what that language uh, might look like. And I think, oh, well, when I get back to my machine, I'll start sketching it out. And of course, when I get back to my machine, I've got some email about a thing I forgot to do. So I never get around to it. But I think using that core language that Idris here exposes, I think I, I, I would love it if people not only had fun with uh, writing new backends for Idris, but also had fun with writing new frontends for Idris. So what, what can you do with this, um, uh, this, this thing I'm claiming is the one true core language? Well, I'm glad this conversation uh, elicited that response. Uh, we have a few more questions uh, from the audience. And apparently nobody has a mic tonight, and I have to ask most of them. Evgeny asks, is it possible to take a function that is in fact linear, but not declared as such, and build a proof that it is indeed linear? Uh, not within the system. Not, 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 not in Idris itself. Um, I could imagine some kind of analysis, like a, a linter that says, hey, this function's linear, maybe you should make it linear. Because this comes back to the, the, the garbage collection question from earlier. So if, if, if you, let, let, let's say if a function is linear safe, that might give you some, some opportunities for optimization. So I can imagine a compile time analysis doing that, but um, I can't think of a way, of, like we don't have that level of um, introspection on, on data types. It'd be nice if we did, but we don't. Thank you. Frederick has another question. I think he's our number one question asker tonight. And just to bring another language into the conversation, does Idris have something akin to Agda modules? Agda modules are sort of like function abstraction, but with a few extra niceties. Yeah, so I've sometimes thought about 
you know, should we have a module of this? Not necessarily Agda style, but um, ML style. And I, I think Agda's modules are kind of similar in, similar in style. And um, the reason I've ended up not doing that is um, interfaces in Idris are almost, but not quite, uh, like modules. And, and I sometimes think we should explore further what that even means. So uh, they're modules in the sense that they provide an interface. You can, you can, you don't have to provide like only one implementation of an interface. Like, um, so in Haskell, you can only provide one implementation of a type class. In, in Idris, you can provide uh, multiple implementations of an interface. And you know, that's, that's, that's got pros and cons that have been debated at length in, in, in various other places. But one, one thing it gives you, because you can have multiple implementations, is you can say, right, well, I'll treat an interface as a module. We'll write this signature. And then we'll just write lots of different implementations for use in different contexts. Um, so this doesn't quite work in Idris 2 yet. It will at some point, but um, interfaces are a high level construct. They translate down to the core language. In that sense, they are first class. So that means you can calculate, barring the fact that the, the desugaring doesn't quite work yet, um, you can write um, a function that computes um, an instance of the interface. So that gives you something a little bit like first class modules in that you could say, well, I have this interface, call it a module. Um, I have a data structure that you know, if, if there's a small number of elements, I'd be better using a list. If there's a large number of elements, I'd be better using a tree, say. So you could write a function that, that calculates at runtime which instance of that module you want, which instance of that interface you want. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't quite give you full modules in one sense, but it gives you a little bit more than modules in another sense, and you've got this uh, first class um, uh, property. So I think interfaces are, uh, are probably the, the right way to, um, to do abstraction in Idris, probably. Uh, Ringer rather than just having things separated by namespace. But um, we haven't really played enough yet with what they can do. <clears throat> So again, the short answer to that is no, <laughs> no but. Thank you. We have two more questions right now. Um, do you have time for two more? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I still got this left. Oh, great, great. Okay, so these will maybe these will be the no, last two. Then. It's still, I, I, I'm I'm too slow a drinker for this. So. Now, now, now it's even warmer. <laughs> so both Plus of the cellar temperature. That's what you want with a British. Uh, both of the questions are from uh, an Andreas, but they're two different Andreases. So first of all, and they both have mics, so they can unmute and ask their questions. So first, uh, I hope I don't mispronounce their names. Andreas Röhle. Röhle, it's good. It's good. I am right. So, okay, so I ask, may Idris contribute some notion of equality as far as I have understood in Haskell? We don't have uh, a class of equality for functions itself. And uh, it's interesting to reason about functions if they are equal or not. Can it just provide something in this direction? Um, yeah, not really. Um, so this, this, this question opens a, a whole can of worms. So the, the question of equality and how to represent it. There's a, <laughs> If you go to a type theory conference, the, the way to start an argument is, is to ask a question, more or less, you know, like the one you've just asked. You know, what does it mean for things to be equal? So, um, so there is a there is an equality type. So it, we, it did come up in passing uh, when I did the RLE because I wanted to have proofs of, um, in order to have a proof of soundness of um, of the run length encoding compression. I needed to have a proof of, uh, so you don't see that explicitly, but you need to have a proof that the things truly are equal. So that works fine for, um, <clears throat> you know, any, any value that you can compute. But as far as functions go, so it, it's only sort of intentional equality. It's only, it's only about equality of definition of the function. So you're not going to be able to, let's say, prove that two functions, if two functions always produce the same output for the same input, then those two functions are equal. That would be nice to have, but we don't have it in the, in, in the, the, the type theory. 
uh, behind Idris, which, by the way, um, disproves my one true core language thing. So, uh, so that's a pity. Um, so uh, we could extend it in various ways. So um, we could go to uh, observational type theory, uh, which says a bit more about um, equality of functions. We could go to homotopy type theory, about which I know almost nothing. Um, so there's all sorts of um, other ways of representing equality that we could have, but don't. That's that's really a question that I've left for um, people who are much more knowledgeable about that sort of thing. I guess it's an example of you know if if someone comes along and wants to in investigate better ways of, of representing equality in Idris, I'd love to hear from them, uh, help them along. So uh, I we can't do an awful lot more than, uh, than 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 what you what you could do in Haskell. I, I just took part at some round about uh, category theory and there was a programmer who used Idris to to answer some questions or to reflect things. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so for, um, you, you can certainly do equality proofs, right? That, that, or you can do, do proofs of equality of all kinds of interesting things, but you can't do proofs of equality of every interesting thing that you might want to. So, like you, you start running into trouble when you try to prove things about higher order structures, for example. But, um, but I mean, my my goal here is is if we if we think of the overall philosophy about uh, being about how do we make um, uh, software uh, correct software cheaper to produce, then maybe we can get away without worrying too much about proofs. So the the, the sorts of proofs we have to do tend to be a bit simpler. And I, I do a lot of, I, I end up having to use a lot of proofs about, you know, associativity of, uh, of appending lists, that sort of thing. These, these things do naturally come up in practice, but um, maybe not so much the, uh, the quality, the complex properties of complex functions. Yeah, much as I'd like to be able to say it's possible to do that. At the minute, it's not. Thank you. <clears throat> so our next Andreas is Andreas Bernstein aus Braunschweig. Yeah. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I have an implementation question. You said that the language core is parameterized over a list of names. So yeah. I'm curious uh, how this list is then used. Are local variables indexing in that list? Or how does it work? Right. Um, so uh, is it a good idea to show you this? Um, oh, I'll put that in off. <laughs> it'll, get, it'll get too deep because I'll, I'll just I'll try to explain it in, in words rather than showing you the type. Um, firstly, I'll say I'm going to go into this in 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 huge depth in this summer school that I talked about, which uh, will be recorded. So you'll you'll see this in much more depth in a few weeks. But for now, what we do is local variables are. Um, so if you've done any program any implementation of, uh, of a functional programming language, you've probably encountered uh, the Brown indices. So the Brown index is a representation of variables by, um, I'm assuming you know this, I'm just telling, <laughs> probably telling the whole audience rather than um, any individual. But uh, yeah, So the Brown index is a way of representing variables by counting the number of variables since it was defined. So zero is the most recently defined variable, one is the next most recent, and so on. So this is part of why uh, scoping becomes a bit of a nightmare when, when implementing uh, a language, uh, particularly one where you have to manipulate terms a lot. So we have to do uh, evaluation of terms, we might have to do substitution into a term, um, we might have to unify two terms that have uh, that, that have local variables and one might have fewer local variables than the other so we have to make them match up and that involves certain kinds of manipulation. And using, but so, so using indices works really nicely for some things not so nicely for others but at the same time you don't want to you don't want to have re things represented as just a name because if things are represented as just a name you're going to get clashes because you know what was that you know if, if if we were all issued at birth with a name supply and they were the only names we were allowed to use when we're writing programs then we might be okay because we wouldn't get any clashes but realistically you know, we're functional programmers, so we call everything X or A. So we can't just use names. 
um, just people wondering whether that was a joke or not. Um, so you, maybe you could decorate the name in various various ways. So I've done on and there's various libraries in in Haskell, probably other languages, for helping you deal with this. So what I've chosen to do instead with the Idris two implementation is kind of have a mix of both. So it's nice to use names for displaying things to the user. Um, it's nice not to have to invent new names unless you really have to. So Idris one would defensively invent new names just in case and you get some very strange messages sometimes. Um, so we have this mix of the ground indices and names where a variable is represented as a pair of a number and a proof that that number represents a specific name in the uh, list of names in the top. So um, at runtime, all you get is the number. You, you just get that index that tells you how far to count back in the context to find the variable you're looking for. This is good news for the evaluator because the evaluator, it just has an index. It just has to look up at a particular index. Um, and the fact that there's a proof is also good news for the evaluator because it means I'm not going to make a mistake, overrun the environment and have a crash. Um, it's also good news for implementing any kinds of manipulations that we've got. So I, like I might need to, like when you go, when you're traversing a term and you have to go under a binder, you encounter a variable. Sometimes you have to increment the index because you're referring to a variable um, before the binder. Sometimes you have to not increment the index because you're referring to a variable after the binder. And I've got that wrong so many times. Um, but now the type checker tells me what I have to do. So I, as I'm traversing the term, um, I come across a local variable. It's all right. Do I do I increment the index here or not? Well, what does the type tell me I have to do? The type um, I'm basically going to have to write a function that says um, <laughs> that counts if it if it's before the binder increment it, if it's after the binder don't. Uh, <clears throat> so um, yeah, that's that's basically how it's been uh, how it's been used. So rather than um, having some library for dealing with names, right, there's some really useful libraries for dealing with names in Haskell um, in, in particular. So I don't have to do that. I just let the type checker um, tell me what I need to do. I'm always slightly worried answering that sort of question because I, I, I don't quite know what, um, what technical background the, uh, the asker has. So apologies if I either assume too much or not enough, <laughs> but... Um, um, let me know if, uh, if that helps. Yeah, thank you. That was super interesting. <laughs> anyway, more on that in the summer school because um, it's, I mean, it's writing these programs with, with, with these proofs is, is enormously frustrating at times, but because, you know, basically it's not type checking, so you can't try it. But at least you know once you finally get the program working, you know it's going to work. So, you know, we make this joke, it type checks, ship it. Well, this is a situation in this very small setting. This is a situation where that's actually true. So, uh... so thank you um, to everyone named Andreas for your questions. <laughs> and I was going to cut it off there, but we actually have one more very nice question, which I think is a perfect closing question okay. for the evening. So, Bernd, please uh, go ahead and unmute and ask your question, which I think we'll all be excited to know the answer to. Uh -oh. uh, hi, uh, you uh, published a few years ago, uh, Type Driven Development, the book, oh, yes. and now it's um, a lot of changes happened to Idris 2. And I, I want to ask if uh, it's also be published like a uh, working title, Real World uh, Idris 2. Ah, that'd be nice, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I get asked this question in a slightly different form occasionally. So I'm, I'm going to ask, answer that slightly different question first. Um, so the question is, uh, should I should I still buy your book now that you've implemented Idris 2? Isn't everything different? Um, and, and the answer to that is, well, I've, I've written a page that explains the differences. And I think what you should do if you haven't used Idris before and, and you want to work through the book, I would, I would actually recommend for the first maybe four or five chapters, just use Idris 1 and and then look at the uh, so I've, I've got this document so i that i kind of started and a couple of people have helped with uh, explaining how to update the examples for Idris 2. but 
it's true it would be a good idea eventually if um if there was some kind of uh, you know, longer term document that actually explained the languages i think people should use it so i'm 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 now saying if you can do anything serious with idris don't use idris one anymore um idris two yes the version number does begin with zero but um it's still so much better than idris one it's so much faster it's more robust like yeah okay the error messages are still kind of ropey but then there were an idris one too uh, the system isn't as polished as it could be but you know that that that'll improve in time so if you're going to do anything real do you do do it in idris too um but yeah, it does leave a question of you know what's the point in the idris book anymore um so i'd say that the the the, the type driven development with idris is is was always meant to be about the ideas behind type driven development rather than about idris itself so obviously idris is the language that's being used to introduce the ideas but that's why a lot of the examples are kind of small and we, we don't really build up to any huge example so yeah that's the answer to the question that uh, that is often asked just you know, just to have that on record that uh, um you know, yes you should still buy it obviously because you know buys me a cup of coffee a month if people buy it <laughs> um but you you can still use it with idris too provided that you're willing to um look at what the differences are but i think your question was more about is there going to be another book that goes a bit further and goes a bit deeper in the the, the real world um <laughs> it kind of seems funny to say real world idris because it's kind of you know, the kind of strange world have i have i wandered into where this happens um but uh i think there, there there could be a place for that um but it now is not a good time to start working on that kind of a book simply because there's a lot of questions still to be answered in how you even use um idris too so so i've learned an awful lot about how to use a zero uh, multiplicity i've learned a little bit about how to use the one multiplicity but um i've given a few talks about idris 2 over the last year or so and i think in every one i've been using linearity in a different way and what you can take from that is i don't actually know how to use linearity best yet so i don't think it's a good idea to write anything down until uh, we've all figured that out uh, but I'd also say, you know, I, I don't have a monopoly on writing books about Idris. Any, anyone can have a crack at it. And I'm, I'm willing to help anyone who wants to write um, some more detailed documentation. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've done that. I'm not doing that again. But uh, maybe one day. Yeah, there, there is a place for such a book, but not quite yet. Well, Edwin, you've been exceedingly generous with your time and uh, I feel like we're uh, privileged to have yeah, you join it's, us. Um, it's rather later than I thought. And uh, the problem is once I start talking about this, I, I start getting too enthusiastic. So, you know. Oh, for, for, fortunate for, fortunate for us. Uh, we can't offer you a proper round of applause, but people have been uh, dropping um, a lot of plaudits into the chat and I can at least wave my hands at you, my thanks for your time. And, uh, and your generosity in, in joining us virtually. I hope you can come to Berlin, look us up if you do at some point in the future when all of this is over. So, so do I. And um, yeah, I, I really mean it when I say Berlin is one of my favorite cities. I, I would love to come back. And I, I was supposed to be there a couple of weeks ago um, for um, ECOOP, but sadly, sadly not. Yeah. So it's a, it, all in person at, at some point. Yeah, it's a shame, uh, but at least we have this opportunity which we wouldn't have had otherwise. So I'm looking for the the silver lining. That's what this meetup is, a kind of silver lining in, uh, in an otherwise dark time. And, uh, and you've been a light for us. Seriously, this has been great. Uh, it's not often that you get to learn about a programming language from its creator. Well, thanks very much for having me. Okay. So, uh, I guess everyone is, uh, if you want to look at the chat, you can see everyone saying goodbye and I'm going to stop the video and I'll, if anybody wants to unmute after I stop um, recording, then uh, feel free to do that. And thank you again, Edwin. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye everyone.